nobody's even talked about the impact of global warming. I don't even understand how that's going to impact workforce, illness, disease, pesticides, insects. I mean, it's just, it just a whole area that we're just not ready yet. And yet it's well over time. The children were on the streets three days ago in the tens and hundreds of thousands all over the world. The children are demanding that the grown-ups do something at the United Nations, at the, at the federal government, local government, and so forth. Um, I just made some notes that I just wanted to kind of just lay out in just in terms of categories before we open up into general conversation. One is that, that the corporations and the growers are family people. They have their own families and they need their own coverage. Their worker needs have to be understood in their totality. The food quality and the production of what they're doing, not only how they grow their food and their animals, but how they protect the population from the impact of that. The pesticide issue in terms of handling insects in a very dynamic situation where with climate change, there's going to be new challenges that have probably not been well understood. Then the corporate burden of the cost, $300,000 for, for Frank's relatively modest you know, kind of facility. And then the policy awareness on the part of the growers, that is, where do they sit down like this and look at the strategic issues and not be intimidated by the enormity of what the solution requires? Because people tend, and the legislature specifically, tends to deal with little problems one at a time and band-aid the situation and not look in a bold way at what would really transform the economy for the growers and for the workers and for the policy people. In terms of the worker situation, care availability we've talked about, coverage patterns that do or don't exist, seasonal challenges you know, that, that are there, the immigration and documentation issues that are there, the toxics that are there, and again, the lack of focal organization that has the capacity to influence decision makers around public policy legislation, you know, and change. And then at the policy level, you have the imposition of the ACA as the dominant model, and yet we know we have somewhere in the vicinity of 1,800 different insurers and coverage plans that are insane, that, that the only solution to that is a Bernie Sanders, you know, in 2016 saying, let's make health care a right for everybody, which we've been saying for, you know, 50, 60 years, the medical community organizationally opposing that because they want to protect their privilege and their wealth at the top of where the organizations are. Uh, and uh, so the context that we're in is just so exciting. It's, I mean, even though it's horrible, the possibilities of tackling these things together are just intoxicating, not in the way of smoking in round Roundup or anything like that, but you get what I'm talking about. So I, I, I just open it up to allow you to kind of talk about this thing. But what I want to get at is this: I want to get at a place when we finish in 35 minutes to where we're going to go next. We're not going to solve anything around this table except how to continue this conversation. <coughs> and what that conversation has to consist of in order to absolutely magnetize people so that we have 50 people around a table like this and hundreds in rooms in town halls where we can bring the issue and attract the populations because people have to understand the personal stake that they have that makes this an essential conversation. So with that, who's got Jim? I'll tell you something. One thing I didn't add as I introduced myself was as part of my retirement, I bought a farm. So I lease it out. Uh, so I'm not troubled with Frank's business aspect of things because uh, I just can sit there and enjoy watching the plants grow and that sort of thing. Well, I have to add, we had asparagus for a while, and I go out and pick asparagus for a while, get something for dinner, take to friends. 
and then I realized I don't I couldn't do it all day like those three guys picking asparagus could. Uh, I mean, there's no machine to pick asparagus, and that is brutally hard work to do it all day. Anyway, maybe if I was in better shape, maybe if I was a way with it. <laughs> anyway, so what the other thing kind of got me going on this was I read where Lake County, just north of Arroyo County, was designated the least healthy county in the state. And um, I don't know all the, you know, it's probably the medical care, the other social determinants of health care and that sort of thing. But, um, but that's in my assemblywoman's area. And um, so when it, they put on a workshop in Woodland, my assemblywoman, um, Cecilia Aguilar uh, Curry, and um, I'm drawing a blank on the fellow's name, Res 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 the one who killed 562. Mendon. Anyway, right. They put on a workshop on how you could uh, apply to be a member of a state commission. So I thought, well, we'll check that out. And they had this big, and they gave, you know, here's what you have to do, and all this kind of stuff. That big, long list of all the commissions. And a lot of them were really pretty esoteric, small little things like that. And I could go through there a couple times. There's no rural health commission. And I think to me, that would be a starting point mm. is to get Congress off their butt and make a rural health commission so you can have those discussions, you can do a needs analysis, because not all rural areas are the same. You know, some up north have depend a little more on timber, some are all rice, some are all almonds and, and that type of, and some are ranches and that type of thing. But where you have that commission that can bring in members, study the issues and find some solutions. And, mine are, and I don't know much about government and all kind of stuff, but someone said, yeah, to start a commission isn't that difficult. So I want to go hammer my assemblywoman because she's the only one who's on the Ag Committee and the Health Committee at the same time. How is that solved in the legislature or, or a, a, a decentral to the legislature? Uh, it depends what they, they, they could be a commission or a committee that's put together. Um, we usually do a select committee on something like that. Uh, what is it where it would be something either under health or under one of the rural caucuses um, if it, for that specific topic. Um, and then they put members on it and then they would do basically the uh, information. The speaker here. would have to do that. Speaker have to or do could a, a local person say to the speaker, you know, I've got five comrades that would like to work on this. The, actually, the best way to do it is you talk to uh, Cecilia and say, "Is there? would you be willing to try to push for something like this? Because that's where a lot of the select committees come from, is members saying, I want to be, I want to need a select committee that covers this area. It's important to know where I'm at. And so, and there are, if you look, there are lots and lots of select committees. Um, and the select committee can do research, investigation, hold hearings. They just can't uh, produce legislation because they're not a, they're not a full committee. But there, a lot of the select committees end up then turning the reports over to one of the uh, other committees or, or members, and then they draw something up. But if you're looking at like a statewide commission, then that's through the governor's office. And uh, I don't know much potential process for that. I've never had to ask uh, them for a commission. So a select committee versus committee. Right. So at the legislative level, it would be a select committee, and then they uh, what is it? And it's just making sure that the member who requested actually does something. There's a joint committee on uh, fair allocation, and fair allocation went away, and that committee was still around for five years with nothing done in it. So, so stakeholders could potentially go to Newsom with a prepared proposal to say, we need some kind of a structure outside of, inside and outside the legislature in order to at least entertain these problems, these challenges. What about the rural caucus? Do they have any um, work in the area of health? Uh, they probably do. I would have been, I wonder if that's another. But I don't know what is it how what is it active the rural caucus is right now. I know that about uh, was it, um, a decade ago, just before I started on the committee, they were really active. Um, but I think for the, the member we most active on it got turned out. Mm -hmm. So um, if what is it there's a wide variety of um, uh, uh, 
like I said, select committees that might even that would touch maybe on the same areas, but I don't have that list on the top of my head. Is there a constructive body among the growers, <clears throat> a corporate structure that really struggles with trying to deal with some of the stuff rather than just survival and farmers are very independent and they're I don't know a forum out there that engage growers in something like this. Right, there you are. Hmm. And that's the key to it is having some kind of collective interest and, and concern that has a, a, a generic benefit. Wow. You, what what about um, aren't there uh, uh, gross associations mm -hmm. and all these groups. So you don't have, because I'm from um, El Dorado County and the area I live in is Apple Hill and wine growing and there is a growers association up there. And you just for fruit, it. for tree fruit. What? Tree fruit as well as wine. Uh -huh. Those are the two primary uh, agricultural. And there's a, a, quite a few growers um, and there is a growers association that makes me, because I'm, I'm trying to work out, I, I really appreciated your comments, I'm trying to work how to work with the business community and help to build a business case for single payer. And you did actually, you, you really, I, I, I do commend you for what you're doing. Um, because from my understanding, I live in the middle of all of the growers, and from what I know, there's very, I get calls from them of how to access healthcare in, for their um, workers. And so we have a couple of federally qualified health centers and you know, community health centers that will provide services regardless of um, insurance. And so I've gotten involved with them trying to help people get services when they need them and get transportation and everything. Um, so I really do commend you for providing health insurance for your farm workers. That is really excellent. And from, from my understanding and reading of some of the latest <coughs> bills, you're right. It's about um, one of the proposals is that business would pay an 8.2% payroll tax I think the first million dollars is exempt, so really small businesses will uh, have their first million dollars uh, exempted, and um, and that would also exclude workers' compensation because everyone would be covered under a single payer system. So the whole workers' compensation system, I believe, will not need to be there. The health component of it is a double component. One is support for people and the other is health coverage. Right. So I, yeah, I don't fully understand. But a big hunk of it will be knocked out. But a out. big hunk of it will be, right. I, I believe, knocked out. The unpredictable part, which is the real you know, arrow mm -hmm. in, the, in the side of the, of, the, of the employers. The health piece goes up and down. The maintenance is, is well understood and, and predictable kind of a piece for people that are getting support, workers' comp support. So, you know, uh, what what builds the case for you, you know, you, you're doing this, my understanding is that it's not going to cost you any more money than you are currently paying. If this is, um, you know, you're paying 7.5% of your payroll uh, and then you exit your some portion of workers' compensation, you're going to be in that 8%, I would guess, in terms of what the payroll tax would be. So what else do you need to, you said you're kind of, for, I'm, just, I'm just trying to test out my well, I, I, business I, conversations with the, before <laughs> I go to the Growers Association <laughs> and. Well, I think a lot of it's just your mindset. I mean, I, I have a farm that I, I value providing these benefits to my workers and I think I have a workforce that that wants to work for me because of those reasons and, and I don't believe that all my competition sees it the same way and I think you guys expressed it very well that not everybody treats their farm workers the same way so I would embrace the system because I understand what it's costing me and I'm willing to look at alternatives but I think there is a pretty big contingent of the grower community that's not as concerned um, maybe as I am and why that is, I don't know. Um, 
it's just the philosophy that we have mm -hmm. in a lot of people. So I don't know how you're going to convince those people. And I think that you look at that even in a larger context of kind of there's so much bad information out there about mm -hmm. medical care for all, but I think the statistics are as 54% of the people in the population of the United States supports it, but there's just a lot of negativity and brings in the whole socialism and all those words that people don't like, right. and I don't know how you overcome that, that you know, it's a it's a philosophical thing mm -hmm. with people. There is, um, there is yeah. definitely. Yeah. Can I just say that the, the numbers that Maureen is working with are, are not hard numbers, and the solution is nowhere near being uh, focused right now. So without having you at the table in order to talk about how, what would be the fairest way for this thing to be worked on that would work for all the stakeholders, we, you know, we, we can't go forward. This thing is not set in stone anywhere. The concept of healthcare as a right is an inviolable concept. What that means is no out-of-pocket expense, no uh, doctor networks, no prohibition because of immigration status. It's, it's everybody gets a card and they get to go to their clinical provider of choice. That doesn't mean a doctor necessarily. This is what we had in 1986 when we did Prop 186. Uh, that everybody would have a Medicare card. They would go anywhere they wanted, get anything they needed, put the card on the table, and go home. If they have some access to right. health care, enough health care. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's again, convenient. in a lot of rural areas, okay. that's one of the big that's issues right. they have. Right. They don't have access because there's no doctors there. Clear, and the reason for that is that medicine is one of the most highly concentrated forms of capital in the American economy, so that you have an agency like this that sits in like five square blocks of medical empire without local services, you know, 15 blocks away in the, the diverse communities and in the poor communities. We've had testimony from one of our colleagues who's a PhD sociologist that studied these things, the investments that UC Davis are making, that Kaiser's making, that Dignity's making, are in areas where there isn't even housing yet, but they know they're gonna be high-end housing as opposed to having the sort resources here. Jobs, transportation, and health resources, you know, have to be hand in hand. They have to be systematically and done. Part of the and housing. Is, and part of the problem is the hospital-based system. Correct. When I work in a hospital-based system, and they call me and says, I need, they, I need to see more patients a day. Yeah. I'm not working hard enough. Yeah. I said, I've been practicing a long time. The computer tells me that 65% of my patients are over 65. Yeah. And even on a family physician, an internist doesn't have to see as many because they're seeing more, more people. The computer says I'm seeing older people because I've been in, well, I was a certified geriatrician for 20 years too. So I, I dealt with nursing home, and so I had a lot you know, elderly population. So it doesn't matter. You're a family doc. You need to see more. And I said, well, if I'm spending more time with my patients, and that helps keep them out of the emergency room and out of the hospital, well, I mean, that's a good thing, right? And I don't think they thought that was such a good thing. Mm. They, they <laughs> thought it was yeah. fine. If mm -hmm. I could churn the patients, if I overlooked something, something went wrong, and they ended up in the emergency room or got admitted to the hospital, they that's made okay. more money. Right. You know, there was no incentive on their part right. to keep people well. I always had strictly a wealth one transfer patients, market. One of my patients went to the hospital, I somehow failed them because I wasn't keeping them well, I wasn't helping them keep themselves mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. uh, and that type of thing. So that was one reason when I was asked to start a clinic for the, for the Native Americans, um, I decided to take it as a challenge. But to add on to that, even though it was their own clinic, uh, they did get money from the Indian Health Service uh, you know, outside of California, we have regular reservations where I was on the Hopi. I was a commissioned officer and worked. I was a government employee. But I was their employee there in Calusa. But the Indian Health Service started a diabetic audit. And I may have told this once before. But so they started a diabetic audit by a couple of women physicians in charge uh, in the early 1990s. 
and every Indian Health Service clinic had to measure the blood pressure, the blood sugars, the lipids, and that sort of thing, and, and keep an eye on. And it started out before the computer. Once we had computers, it was a lot easier. And uh, and you look at a graph of new start dialysis patients, and for blacks, Native Americans, Asians, and whites, it kept creeping up, creeping up. And all of a sudden, about 1988, 1998, roughly five or six years after this program started, new start dialysis started to drop for Native Americans, showing that if you do intensive primary care, it's going to save the system money in the long haul. So that's... Not to mention you know, so emancipating if we, people. If we have single payer, we keep doing things the same way we're doing them, it probably will cost a whole heck of a lot of money. Yeah. But, but if we start preventing complications of chronic disease, then we will save money. There may be a several year lag time, but it's that's what will pay off in the long haul, in my opinion. Yeah, I think the health care, uh, the issue of uh, physicians and nurse practitioners being educated is, is huge because it's just absurdly expensive. So it gives a clear edge to children of rich people. But the ones that get, get into it and end up with a debt of what, 300,000 or more, mm -hmm. more than that, huh? Yeah. I mean, they can't help but be motivated by the, the cost issue, which is in direct conflict with uh, our hopes that there would be people with idealism and, and concern for the welfare to serve. Of Even if they're ideal and they have that much debt, they're going to be forced to go be a radiologist in the big city yes. so rather it, than work their butt off for half a million money in a rural town. But we know, based on the language and the law, that there's going to be major subsidization for health professionals' uh, uh, education. So that's a given. That's that's a given. That We can't go forward with a transformed system without making a commitment to local comprehensivity and to quality new kinds of, of, uh, of providers. Yeah. I think working, Dr. You know, I'm agree with you. I've been working in a system where um, the corporation is pushing doctors to see 60, you know, people. And something that I see, you know, people a day. yeah, 60, yeah, 60, 60 people a day. 60, 60, 60, 60 oh, zero. You know, yeah, six zero. Care yeah. Like so that's me. You know, uh, doctors see, need, this is need see to them. see. You see them and then you say goodbye. Yeah, they need mm -hmm. to see seven, you know patients in an hour. So that's mean eight minutes on per it's patient. It's craziness. That's not healthcare. See? It's not healthcare. We know that. And uh -huh. that's that's yeah. uh, we were down to seven minutes. that's that's the problem, it's especially in, in, in rural health areas. Well when I work for D there's very little um, that's what the family doctor is supposed to be down to yeah. seven minutes. So they need yeah. <laughs> yeah. No wait, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. What's well, your thought? Like 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 I was sharing, uh, there are certain health clinics, but the, you always see a lot of uh, patients, people waiting long hours mm -hmm. to to be seen. And when they're seen, it's like five to seven minutes. Mm -hmm. While they turn them, take them in, they wait in the waiting room, inside that room, whatever, whatsoever, and then the the doctor comes in or the assistant or the intern comes in and can only see the patient very little time. And it, there's been times that I take my mom, my mom is 84 years old and she's got, right now she's got dementia and the whole thing. And and it's, it's very hard to, at times, ask questions. You know, what's gonna happen with her? What, you know, in terms of the, the general doctor and, uh, um, other people get involved whatsoever, but the doctor that we need to get answers from, we don't get we don't get the answers because. So the other side, my dear, is that 12% uh -huh. doctors are killing themselves, and the exactly. burnout is That's massive, and it's all being driven by this dehumanizing corporate demand. Not right. only they don't have seven minutes, but they're looking at the computer six of those seven minutes, yes. filling yes. out stuff yes. like your you know 25 boxes that have to be checked. So <laughs> yes, that the, right. the, the, the mechanization and the dehumanization from the way in which mm -hmm. profits are driven in the system, which have to be documented for billing purposes, is part of the yeah, toxin. The and it really sprayed on the on the profession. Right. That's right. And the really good programs prompt you, well, if you put in this as this, then you could upgrade your charge a little bit. 
Right. right. So, you look so, it, so it's upcoding. Sure. Yeah. 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 I want to make a couple of. Uh, first of all, the media and uh, politicians and uh, self-interested business people. Uh, all these people are spreading unbelievable kinds of uh, misinformation about single payer. I just heard him saying that I don't trust the government providing the care. Right. Single payer. I don't. Government I, does not give care. I didn't care. say the care. I said okay. the administration or the or the, the administration uh, for since. Medicare has been passed until now. Medicare has to run smooth. And as I said during my practice, I was never pressured by Medicare that you cannot order this test or that test or mm -hmm. how many times I can see my patient. Right, with 3% anything, overhead. Anything like that. If a patient is sick and I have to follow him, every week until he gets better or yeah. she gets better, I'm allowed to do that. But insurance companies, they don't, I have to justify why I'm seeing them right. that right. frequently. It's a same question, seeing 60 patients, 70 patients per day in eight hours. Mm -hmm. It's because of the profit motive. All these corporations and the big doctor groups like the Sutter Medical Group, the, the, uh, Mercy, Dignity Health Medical Group, whatever other groups, they want to make more money. How can they make more money, hire less doctors, less uh, nurse practitioners, push them to... Right, everybody's getting mill. squeezed, so the and question is this where... This will be all gone if we have a not-for-profit government-run insurance system, which is, uh, that's what single payer is. Right. And then there was a uh, poll uh, just they were uh, telling about it about two, three weeks ago that when you ask people, do you support single payer, 80% of them said yes. Then when they were told, what if there is no private insurance, will you still support? Then the support drops to 40%. Mm -hmm. the, the reason is they are messing this up, saying, Private insurance is needed along with single payer. Right. They're not telling them that single payer provides you all the needed care, from heart surgery, brain right. surgery, to right. uh, primary care, anything you want, single payer pays for it. So why do you need this for-profit health insurance, which restricts all kinds of care? The highest rationing of health care is in this country. Every other country that provides single payer, their life expectancy rate has gone up. Here it has gone down from 80 or 82 years down to 76 years life expectancy because people cannot afford. Here's the issue though, Howard. I'm sorry. So I just wanted to clarify. I said the government's not very good at delivery. And I will qualify that with, I don't think they were very good at delivery with this Affordable Care Act and covered California. Uh, yeah. But I will, yes, I will totally agree with you on on Medicare because I, I haven't heard anybody that's that's disappointed with Medicare. Uh, and my dad's 95 years old. He loves it. And it's not enough. It's yeah, not, but, well, but it doesn't have enough. But Medicare as it is but, but, now is incomplete and mm -hmm. not, you know, not right. enough. You have to have right. a copay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So the, the question here, I think, is is what we could potentially stimulate that would uh, focus in two or three major areas an interest effort to try and bring some extended conversation and some action. Clearly, the whole idea of the fact that there's not any think tank looking at the rural community, not from an exploitative standpoint, but from a sustainable standpoint and an inclusive standpoint to make sure that everybody living in the area is doing okay. Everybody living in the, in the area is doing okay. The whole issue of looking at providing local services, a transportation, housing, jobs, you know, has to be somehow looked at carefully. Uh, 
I think that the fact that the growers don't have a group, a leadership group, that is anticipating this, because they have to look at climate change as well. I mean, there's some long-term serious policy challenges that are going to hit everybody and hurt everybody. And it just seems to me that, that there's two kinds of growers, Frank. There's the family grower like you, and then there's the alienated corporate grower that, that, that you know, is not involved in the, in the land at all. You know, they run the operation, but they don't get, they don't know where corn comes from necessarily. I'm, you know, at a very real level. And at times they, they hire um, labor contractors. Yeah. yeah. And the labor contractors are one of the worst in terms of treatment of workers. Sure. And much less, uh, they're the ones that uh, prohibit and do certain things for workers not to complain if they get injured on the job or there's anything that's that's happening to workers or if they, they don't even allow workers to miss like for example if a mom needs to take her her child to the doctor if she misses then she's punished two three days of no work and and then uh, she's lucky she's gonna get her job back just because right. you know things like that like the old days like yes. it's always been yeah yeah so Whomever hires labor contractors don't want to deal with workers. Don't want to just want to you know get their 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 profits. Um, uh, this is what I'm going to pay you as a management company, and then you deal with it. And of course, the labor contractor doesn't love the doesn't love the land, doesn't love uh, agriculture. They just want to do the work for the for the money. for the company for money, and and that's how they treat power. the workers too. And yeah. personal power. Yeah. I just think this is so interesting. I mean, it just, it's just incredibly interesting how rich this is and how obvious it is to how to fix this thing, except it's got to, it's going to require some organization and some groups to begin to talk about this stuff. I mean, is Curry your, your representative as well? And your senator is Nielsen? Who? Uh, Dog. And, and where is he? He's out of Napa. And what's he like? They're, he's a good guy. And Cecilia Agacuri is great. I, I like both of them. And she's, she's an actual, uh, they have a farming operation. They have, uh, they do uh, organic walnuts, a uh, small operation. I think it's 80 acres. Um, but yeah. Winters. Mm-hmm. Uh, winters. Yeah, out of winter. So yeah, they, 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 she's a. What? Uh, what are the possibilities of, of us having a follow-up meeting in, you know, within the next month or so that you would bring some colleagues that you know? You must know one or two other people that you talk with. They don't have to necessarily agree with you because nobody's going to agree until they've had some opportunity to do some thinking and talking and kind of getting on the same page. And I don't know about Millie because there's no... Uh, farm worker cadre here, and she's down in Burbank. And down no, in I live in the Coachella Valley. Whoever uh-huh. knows where it is, Pompey. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I was in, in Ventura County, and this is why I flew from, from Burbank. Um, but uh, Merced is uh, one of the closest areas where I. They're very, very active, and they everything I said, even more. They can say. Uh, There's or, some women there that, that can speak yes. the talk. Yes, uh, uh, her name is Erika, but I can I can speak with you about yeah. her later. Uh, she comes from a migrant farmer family. Right now, she's she's a staff of, of the organization, and she works with um, uh, the group of women in that in that uh, in that county, and they do a lot of. I mean, all these women, uh, they can tell stories, but. You know, and they can be active. They, they they like to take action and support when there's something that they, it's there for them to to do. They they just I mean, these women are many of them are single moms and uh, they they earn very little. They have a family and and they try to do you know, ends meet or whatever. And but um, they're active because they know it's it's um, it's a way for them to. Um, 
have the family to succeed, you know? So if we can't expand the talk about this in this kind of a circle, then we're not going to go anywhere. It's going to stay the same. The instruments are on the ground. They're, 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 the single payer is there. The conversation is there. ACA is there. You know, everything is in flux. An election is coming up. And there's... ACA should be abolished. Yes. That's the only so way ACA is, is in large part our enemy because it's 100% you know, support to the insurance industry. And, and, and somehow or another, that corporate cartel was able to block any kind of meaningful alternative except Medicaid, which is totally unacceptable. I mean, it, it just it doesn't pay enough, and it, it's a it's a harmful system that people rely upon. But I, I think that, you know the fact that Victor's here, and maybe you can help us a little bit in terms of what would be the right group to meet with and with the right group. I mean, what what what, what would open up a conversation? that would not fizzle out if we stayed on it. Because obviously there's some incredible opportunities here to do some really important things that have to be done, otherwise people are gonna continue to, to go down. I mean, the prices are gonna go up. The alienation from the conversation is even more pernicious than the costs going up. If, if he can, he, like, he, people like him can't be in the conversation for a fix, a, a strategic fix, then the costs are not as painful as that, even, ironically. So it seems like it'd be a no-brainer if you can eliminate one of your costs. If, if, you're, if your income's dictated by who buys your crop, if, and there's probably fewer and fewer people who buy your crop, it's like there's probably fewer and fewer people who you can buy seed from, to eliminate one of those costs. It seems like you want to jump at that chance. There's just a lot of bad information out there what the cost of, of that this, it would be. And, and you read some of these statistics of how many trillions of dollars it would cost. It's already there, Frank. It's all, I know, all that I, I'm, just saying, I'm, not yeah. dis, I'm just saying there's a bad information you out bet. there. How you can, that's to me is how you can educate people with the proper facts. It's always right. about education and I just don't know how you get that information out there. Little, you know, it's little by little. So it's our, you know, I, you know, you know, I, I, contacting the Chamber of Commerce, contacting the Growers Association, having house parties with people in the community. We're trying to have speakers at the local Republican Party uh, meetings, um, so that there actually become it's something people start talking about. I don't, you know, it's little by little community organizing. I think that there has to be a group of three or four, five of you that put together a proposal that has three or four points in it that we would then take to Curry and Dot so that there's an agreement as to what needs to be done for this issue to be properly addressed. I don't mean let's stop spraying because that's down the line. The issue is, who's gonna talk about whether the toxic, where the toxics are? Who's gonna talk about how to preserve the agricultural economy from the grower's standpoint because of the increasing burden that they are suffering, which requires them to then pass the burden down the hill? You know, I mean, how are we gonna deal with the distribution, redistribution of health resources to local areas with the proper transportation. I mean, these are monster problems that are easier to fix than little problems, ironically, paradoxically. It's better Does to the medical community support this? What's the statistics there? It's all over the place. 64 plus percent of the doctors uh, support government paid care. The problem is that bulk of the doctors have no voice. They work under corporate voices like Dignity, Sutter, Kaiser, whose top leadership are in the multi-millions and oh, who is the American Medical Association. Against, no, no, always against, from, no. from day one, they were against Medicare. So why is that? Um, well, the, the main reason they are like that is 
only 20% of the entire doctors community in this country belong to AME or CME. The rest of them are not members, but they claim they represent everybody. Number one. Number two is those people who are in that association or groups, they are majority of them are the ones who have their own for-profit corporations or businesses or surgical centers Conflict or interest. Uh, imaging centers or whatever else and they want to continue to be providing that care, making more money and that's protected by CMA and AMA. That, and CMA and AMA, they publish a lot of things and they advertise a lot. All those advertisements come from drug companies and insurance companies. But let me just say that. Money. Let me just say that there are blocks of organized doctors and nurses and other health workers that can be easily reached and moved. The problem is having the time and the outreach to go do it and to talk sense to people. For example, the American Public Health Association has tens of thousands of professionals. They're all committed to this because they understand it even a higher, they're interested in health, not the absence of illness. The primary care doctors, the family practitioners, the general practitioners, the people that are not at the high end of the earning spectrum and that aren't totally caught up with ego and, and the need for power and control. I mean, there's, a, there's a, an intentional uh, uh, constriction on how many doctors are produced every year and that you have to be a doctor as opposed to a nurse practitioner or a, or a physician's aide or whatever because of the, the issue of income, control, power. And so that's been going on for over 100 years. This is an old, old struggle of elitism you know, and, and domination by a white male by law uh, uh, population. So things are in, in, in major flux right now. I mean, the, the increase of women medical students is enormous, you know, and male nurses. And, and there's, there's an opportunity for conversation that is rich and open and just requires being engaged. Now, the problem is, where are the other 30 people that needed to be in this room who knew about this meeting who are committed to single payer and to reform that didn't come, and why didn't they come? Did they not understand what the relevance of it is, or do they not have fun talking about and dealing with some real high quality solutions and understand what not coming with a high quality solution leaves us with? I, that's, I don't know. I would like to invite you, if possible, Jim, Victor, you know, to sit down and to come up with three critical, strategic, structural recommendations that we can then decide upon that really feel right, feel good, feel like they really make a difference. And then let's set up a meeting with Dodd and Curry and maybe even Newsom. And let's talk to him about it. To do these things, we're going to need a commission. You know, we're going to need. What I would throw out, right? I mean, I do think you need a commission to study it, but you reactivate, you strengthen. Rural caucus? The districts. After World War II, they made hospital districts because they wanted to put hospitals out. Beautiful. In the, and my understanding is because Cecilia did some bill having to do the districts, I don't know the details, but if that structure is still there, you may or may not be pushing for a hospital, but if you already have that clinic, you put in what's equivalent of a fairly qualified rural health clinic, right. you put in two family docs, not one, because having solo for 15 right, right, years, right, right, I would right. not recommend right. so, right. and, and the burnout would be bad. You have a, the equivalent of a patient-centered medical home run by two or more family docs, depending on whether you're gonna be supporting a hospital in that area as well. You have one or more caseworkers or, or care coordinators because part of a uh, patient-centered medical home is that the loop is always closed. You send the patient down to the city to get some procedure done, you make sure they made it, and you make sure they get back, and you make sure you get the report. 
Um, and then whether there's a pharmacy that can, uh, I forgot the number now, but certain pharmacies you can um, get the same price that VA gets for medications, whether you dispense them there or not. Um, but that could be within the district system that's already there, you go for clinics and your hospital. The most successful district hospital is the one at Truckee. Here's my four areas. One, there has to be some discussion about what would promote justice, and that has to be talked about, and, and there has to be a justice agenda. The second thing is that there has to be a delivery model. The third thing is that there needs to be a policy body to study and do the outreach that has the authority, both at the legislative level and at the executive level. And finally, there needs to be advocacy bodies of stakeholders, growers, workers, policy people, advocates. Those four things have to be somehow built into the proposal to Curry and to Don. Yeah. The other thing is the payment. Either you salary those positions. To me, that's the model. What, what I that's liked what the I best call the model. was when I was an officer in the public health service. When I was in Clues, I was salaried by the, the, the clinic there. And because they told me, we don't want a treadmill type clinic. We want to make sure everything's taken right. care of. And uh, I mean, if you do that, you still have to monitor the work so someone's not investment system, so you have to salary them, or everybody knows what the RBU systems are. Jim, you know? that's the model issue. That, 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 that detail, that granular detail, is, is essential when you have a situation where you can actually talk about the model and that that's relevant to put into the puzzle. Before you can talk about the model, you have to have a framework that will hold the conversation. We don't have that. We don't have that. Frank doesn't have that. He's out there by himself trying to be a good guy, you know, beginning to move more and more towards, um, you know, non-pesticide, organic growing, natural growing, you know, experimenting, you know, with his operation and being squeezed to death. He could be potentially put out of, potentially be put out of business within the next 10 years as a result of the clear escalation of prices and the crush that it's going to happen to his business, you know, by impersonal, you know, forces. The new health commission of that. Uh, Patrick, I have a Got it. Is there? Uh, is this, you is this worth continuing? Uh, are you open to? We have to. I have a, we have to talk. I, I I have a pretty busy life, and I I've got to watch. I'm not I looking to busy. suck you. I suck your life out. We have to talk. But, you know, I enjoy I'm really this looking forward to doing it. Thank friend. you for inviting me. Thank you for coming, Frank. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Thank you. I knew you. I knew you were busy, and I was go. Oh, gosh, I asked Frank or not. <laughs> so thanks Thank for you very much. Keep in touch. Thank you all very Thank much. You. Great Thank conversation. You. Yeah, I, I need to get going too. But I'm wondering about the, the health commission that's supposed to be coming up with the single payer system for California. That's not. That's not going to include this. This is going to disappear. This question is not visible. It's not visible. It's not visible to his committee. It's not visible to the governor. You know, we're the ones that are holding it together. This this little tiny conversation. I mean, I mean, you think he's going to be there? I'm sorry. You think he's going to be there when we need him? Hard to say. Like I say, he's really busy. I was almost. I was kind of surprised he was willing to come tonight. So it'd be interesting if you would follow up and talk to him about whether he thought the conversation was fair whether it was semi-complete and whether it was constructive in terms of the next step. Yeah, I want to talk to him more about, I mean, you asked about a growers organization. The largest one is the California Farm Bureau. And there's, there's um, each county has a, a member, and of course there's the American Farm Bureau. The oldest organization is the National Farmers Union. As far as I can find out, they aren't that active in California compared to the Farm Bureau. Um, the important thing is we can't be asking the AMA analog, you no, know. A AMA is, we don't even bother with that. No, you know what I'm saying? The AMA analog in the farmer's world. Oh. So we've got to be able to figure out either we have to come up with a different group, and then the question is where where is Erica and where the farm workers sit <coughs> at the table so that there's absolute, you know, par parity? The other organization that I'm, I just joined that paid my 77 bucks it's the California Rural Health Association. 
they're having their statewide conference in September in Rockland. So I'm planning on going to that. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure. In October? I, in September, I think it is. Um, so obviously, if they're called how about, how about proposing putting a panel together in that meeting that would include Millie, Victor, Frank? I said, I said in my money, I don't know any of the people yet. I, I, I have to work on that. Because <coughs> if there's a meeting in September, we could be ready with something really thoughtful and really exciting to talk to them about. I, I don't know how many people come or whether it's the right forum, but the, the ask has to be planned. The ask has to be planned. What, what's the machinery that is going to be the vehicle to be able to entertain the change? Without the vehicle, asking for the change will fall through the cracks. So what other groups have you invited? I mean, I'm, I'm, Excuse I know me. about... I really, I've got an hour drive. Marie, thank I you. Need to go. Do you have any, any last, any shots across? I was the... just, you know, checking out his agricultural committee and, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. We've talked about a lot of things that lead straight to action. Around this table. You know, all I'm, I, I've got my actions, I'm, you know. Same. Yeah, well, but they're single payer actions, you know, like I'm working with the business community, I'm working, I'm going to go see the, talk to the growers, see what's going on from their perspective. Um, you know, we're doing house parties, I, you know, it's a, it's a job. And so, I'm sorry, I, I don't have any more ideas, and you know we got our niche up there that Thank you for I'm coming working on. Thank and I like to keep in touch. I always learn something new when I come down here. And Great. See. Any thoughts you have or recommendations about anything as you drive home and think about this? If the music doesn't get it's listened. little by little. That is, you know. It's what little by what little. That's the it's community. Well, community education trying to get into the business community to help them. We're getting, we have Yeah, but we gotta get more of them. Correct. And we've gotta have some better answers about cost and money. I, I think this whole idea, it's a, a nice thought that we don't have to be concerned about cost. But I have not talked with anyone that is satisfied with the idea that, you know, we go into these wars, we build their planes. We do all this stuff and no one's asking about the bill. This one, we've got to have some better answers to because you saw what his perspective, you know, money is a piece of his life. Clearly. And so, you know, I, I'm i continuing like, uh, you know, is however weak it is, that's all I have and no one can give me anything more. So I would like to be able to answer that question for businesses, you know, for community members, for individuals. The problem is you can't be certain because the bill There's no matter. certainty. I don't claim you know, to have certainty. People have to understand that they're not locked into a no, number. No, this is, there, this is one model that has been well researched and studied and you can look into it if you want to. So what did he say percentage that he's paying out of his money? He's, what is this, 300000 He's paying 7.5% of his payroll. That's, that's, so that's his $300,000. His $340,000, 7.5% of his payroll, plus whatever his workers' comp is. So so he, he would be in the ballpark of yeah, one model of 8%. It would be a wash, and it'd have much better care and a lot less... Castle, and again, he would have administrative savings, right. tremendous administrative savings from what they're going through right now. Um, right. My bottom line is we got to keep this conversation going in a way that's relevant. And, uh, and so you're busy and you're doing, you're making your contribution and we'll, I'll come back to you, we'll come back to you. Did you sign in, by the way? Of course. Good. And so, again, thank you for coming. You're very welcome. And you're very welcome. I wish, you know, I wish there was an easy answer to this. But unfortunately, all I can see is having little conversations. Like, hopefully, you have gone away with some more, you know. I don't have patience for little conversations. Before, you know, I, tell I you. know. I know you don't feel I don't have time for this. What else do we have? Bigger conversations. 
bigger conversations and a strategy to bring around change. Yeah, well, I'm You're doing it. You're doing it. I am trying, you know, Governor Newsom needs to be held accountable is the other big issue. we got to set a team to go talk with him and, and set up a time to meet with him that has the clout to be able to get him to meet. Because, you know, the easiest thing they have is not meeting. Well, I wonder about he and HP connecting with the physicians in the Bay Area. That's the Bay Area group. That's Hank's job. No, but to go see Newsom could be a combined effort of PNHP in the greater Bay, Sacramento. They don't understand the issue, Marie. We do. They don't get what we're talking about. They're not. Who they're doesn't not, get it? The Bay Area physicians are not talking about agricultural health. This is about agricultural health. We'll deal with toxics. We'll deal with elderly and social security. Green New Deal. Green New Deal gotcha. has got all of, all of the making of um, the issues for rural health, too, I think. Bye. We'll talk. Thank you. Bye. So, Victor, what, what uh, help us a little bit here just to, I mean, we're, we're way over time, but I, I just, it's so precious, I just don't want to dissolve I without some kind coffee. of a decision. What, what, what should, what one or two steps should we do next? That would the thing I tell everybody when they're trying to uh, figure out how to get the conversation started is what you're doing. You know, you know, agriculture or at least you've met her before. Oh yeah, I did. Well, I <laughs> it's kind of interesting. I was at the Yolo um, Land Trust dinner and I happened to sit next to her all dinner long and uh, got the chatting and. I introduced the idea of social determinants of health care. She hadn't heard that term before, so I was... I mean, so that's where you got to make those connections to begin with, with an with, uh, individual legislator, um, people from their district, and then those in, 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 in uh, a wide variety of voices from their districts. That catches their attention and, catch, and, and, and will help them at least focus a little bit. But just remember, there's going to be a counter-narrative out there also. Um, and I know you hate the idea of little conversations, but my entire life is the legislature little conversations um, uh, and they eventually sometimes lead to bigger things but everything is a small conversation and it's also a wide variety of conversations and I think I mentioned today I dealt with um, land trust issue an animal blood bank issue uh, was it handing out a certificate at Ag Day um, and then dealing with uh, greenhouse gases and you know, it was in large animals so that was just that's, that's an average day they're all small conversations so trying to be able to get somebody to be able to focus on the issue. Um, what I mean by a larger conversation is a commission, a caucus, a structure in order to hold the little conversations because we don't have an apparatus. The it, farm it, workers have lobbyists in the legislature that are holding the line and trying to survive. They're not initiating broad policy legislation. And this legislature is organized in a way to make broad policy legislation difficult. The reason I came to you was because I wanted to make sure, because I understand the connection with health and agriculture, I want to make sure that you were aware of what was going on, what was not going on with the health committee. I mean, that's how we met, as I brought you in the newspaper, right? So to, 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 to mount this conversation, I, I think we touched on three or four concrete things. I don't know how it fit with your insight into where you want to bring your hammer in. Like, is is a commission make sense to you? Does a rural caucus make sense to you? How, where do you place the voice of organized labor at you, in terms of your honest contribution? Yeah. yeah the What I'll say is, is this, um, it's very hard for us to, this is very important. We don't have the resources. We can't, we can't just uh, say, okay, we're gonna move, uh, which I, we did today, uh, everything away so that we can come and do this, this kind of uh, important work. Um, but I'll try to have conversations with the director, which is my successor, uh, to see if uh, people can, can, other people can join. 
I do, I, I did have, and I was trying to say it earlier, is I do have some questions, is that why other groups are not invited yet, or what is to going this on table? to this table in terms of, um, uh, there's many other workers, or many other, um, yeah, many other workers that uh, could be contributing uh, for example, not only domestic workers, janitors, all these, all these workers that really need this kind of um, uh, support. Um, I'm talking about um, all these other groups that we know about and we've been collaborating on other issues. Um, and, uh, the issue here is agricultural health because it's a handle. It's, a, it's not workers in general, organized workers. There is an organization that's driving this campaign called Healthy California Campaign Coalition okay. that has SEIU and that has AFSCME in it, has all the groups potentially in it, the teachers organization and so forth. I'm interested, that's an indigestible lump. Mm -hmm. That's getting ready for a proposition. That's trying to organize six million people yeah. in the state in the next couple of years. My interest is to bring real content because I'm interested in healthcare, and without understanding how toxics, urban development, public health, water, agriculture are woven into a healthcare model like Jim is talking about. Jim's talking about the medical delivery system, but what has to be added to that clinic is a public health engineer and a bunch of other specialists yeah. that are dealing with the things the other 90% of the things that influence health outcomes. Medicine only influences 10%. We know that. Well, California really helps us clean. <laughs> okay, so, yes. so okay. I, this, is an, this is now, we're gonna Well, that was a conversation I think I was clear about in terms of, yes, there was an interest about us sharing our, you know, so that we can contribute so that people could learn a little bit about our issues, our health issues, our concerns, and all that. Um, so, were you offended by anything he said? Did anything strike you as being, you know, class antagonism in terms of his assumptions and perceptions? Did um, something turn you off? No, no, no. I'm, I'm not easily turned off by, you know, farmers or whatever. And. and let me, I, I do also want to share that I do come from a, a farmer's family from Mexico. My grandparents from my dad's side, they were farmers. And uh, my father always wanted to go back and we had some land over there and, and it did not work out because of the economy in Mexico. So we always en ended up coming back to the United States. But over there, it was a very different situation. Coming over here, it was um, uh, leaving the, the poor of the poorest. And uh, it was a very rough, tough situation. This is why my family always wanted to go back. And, and of course, my mom was over there. But um, in, in terms of, um, I, in terms of what he said in, uh, about uh, not having, uh, Big turnover. That that's. I mean, I, I, I it resonated with me because uh, out of all the all the all the different jobs that we had during the time we were doing the migrant work, uh, there was only one grower, and that's and, and one company, as as I explained, that really it's uh, trustworthy. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and so it resonated with me. Yeah. yeah. You know, in a positive but, way. Yeah, in a, in, a, in a positive way in the whole thing. But, you know, there, there could be, I mean, he's thinking about his, because it's a business. He's thinking about his business, business that's fine. A business is business. Um, uh, and because it's business, um, he needs, in his mind, he needs to be convinced it's going to be worthwhile and it's going to be something that's going to, be successful for it for, for in order for him to get involved. If not, then he might he might not continue. So uh, for us, it's it's not necessarily. I mean, 
for us is about resources. How, how can we make sure we can be able to be at the table and uh, we don't have resources to be doing this. Um, uh, it's, it's very hard and uh, the executive director of the organization that uh, we're representing um, was, I, I had invited her to come. To Erica. Be the one, no, that's Suget Lopez, it's someone else. She, she is in, uh, in, she lives in Fontana and she goes to work to Oxnard, <laughs> so you can also have an idea. And, uh, but um, it's, it's a lot, it's, it's very little resources that we have to be able to, to spread out. It, yeah, and to here. come all the way over here. Yeah. So, uh, we did some sacrifices in order to, to, to be here. I mean, uh, we're, we're working on some, some other campaigns of other things that, and um, uh, we felt it was important to come. And uh, the, the thing is, how, how can we continue supporting and being and, uh, engaged, involved, there. Yeah, being yeah. engaged, um, I don't know, maybe being on the phone, I don't know. I mean, just um, uh, some of us being on the phone and being able to. It's to easy to do. Engaged. If there was a planning group of two or three people looking at what to go to Curry and Dot about, that you might help shape so that it was the right language, the right pitch, because we need we need some refinement in terms of how to frame policy invitation, policy challenge. Uh, you can be on is. FaceTime, you can be, I mean, there's the phone, you know, you can be in the room without having to schlep up here. Yeah. I think there is yeah. something to individual conversations, too. I mean, I think that's where a lot of it makes me think when I was on the reservation there, they tried all these lectures and all this kind of stuff, but just a one-on-one -on -one talk is what, yeah. what helped them understand their diabetes and don't drink soda anymore. But You're talking I, about with a legislator or with? No, I'm just saying it's an example of communicating and getting right. things done. So, but the same thing. I mean, I've been in facilities, facilities office a number of times. The staff knows me, who I am. Um, so I'm going to talk to her uh, even on an individual basis, is not a waste of time. Right. <clears throat> I mean, to have more people show up is good too, but I hate, I hate a multiple approach. Do you think that Millie and Elizabeth can help you? It, and where's the nexus between you as the organizer anchor with PNHP and with the agricultural policy thing? How do you? see relating to them or how do you see establishing you know, their involvement? I don't know whether you can answer that quickly. But yeah, is, my thing is if you, if you develop a message you want to have and if it's a message that you guys agreed with, having you, I think you are in Eduardo Garcia's district in Coachella, right? is that your assembly member? Yes. Yeah, so um, uh, for them to be able to contact him with the sort of the same message, um, and, and then, then Elizabeth is in the Ventura County. So that's right? Jackie Irwin, right? Yeah. Or, okay. Um, so the idea that uh, each of these folks are different areas and that it can be able to reach out to uh, and a broad spectrum. We're, we're, in the, we're in, let's see, uh, where the women are very good and we're very well connected with um, the, the different uh, representatives. It's the Monterey County, the Santa Barbara County, the Ventura County, the Kern County. Sorry. Uh, well, that's Monterey County. Um, uh, Fresno County, and of course the Riverside County. Those are those are the the area, and of course the districts. You so, know. Yeah, where the just from what you've named, that's five legislators there. So, and even able to have those conversations at a, at a level of legislators. And then if you guys had some sort of lobby day, having similar people come up and talk with people, people with the same message come and talk to the members again, they're like, oh yeah, I talked to you because I'm in my district, or you from my district, and they'll remember that conversation. Because uh, part of the thing is, is for the legislators to get on their, I mean, they hold a lot of stuff on their plate, and um, uh, everybody gets upset when they hear that, but what's important to you may not be important to them until it's brought their attention. Especially, it was brought to attention by people who, what is it, live in their districts. Um, 
it, so, it's always much more powerful for a member to hear uh, an authentic voice coming from their district than right. you know having me come in and talk to them. But we need so, the message. We need to have right. a common set of three or four asks. I just say that arbitrarily. Speaking, speaking of lobbying, does RCRC do anything else besides lobbying? They, what do they do, some research and uh, outreach, um, but most of their stuff is, yeah, trying to figure out how things impact rural counties. I know that they've touched on health care issues before, but um, again, because it's not my daily way, what is it? It's, it's something they wouldn't come to talk to me about. Usually when they're talking to me, it's about land, rent, land policy issues, uh, new regulations. Um, uh, they've written a couple of letters on bills we have up right now. Did you like this tonight? Did this feel good to you? Uh, I'd like to have been better prepared myself, but uh, that would be also pretty good. I thought you were very well prepared. I mean, I thought you were, I mean, the fact that you're honest and open and, you know, kind of just swinging with this, because, you know, we're all groping to try and figure out how to put this thing together. It's not put together. It's not put together. There are not the machinery to address these profound, wonderful questions that I think would uh, uh, elicit a lot of support. I mean, but so I, as he said, we got to get the yeah. facts out. There's a lot of misinformation, and they, and, they, and even doing that one on one, I think it helped. Um, All right, uh, so it's like yeah, yeah. Thank I had an hour drive, so thank you very, very much. <laughs> Lodi, oh boy, oh yeah, very, very, very much. And so I, I will. I mean, I guess we'll figure it out. And yeah, what is it? Um, uh, if you like following up, or if you want to follow up, what is it? Um, I work. Leave Cecilia's office also. Um, so, uh, Who are the five legislators, babe? Who are the five? Uh, Monterey is Robert Rebus. Um, Rebus? Yeah, Santa Barbara is Jackie Irwin. Uh, Ventura, no, Ventura is Jackie Irwin. Yeah, yeah, what is it? Uh, it's uh, Lamont. Uh, I'm blanking on the front first name. Um, Kern? Uh, Kern is. Uh, Salas, or is it? Do you know? Salas? You know Sa yeah, Salas is in that area. So is um, Rambula, but he's a little off the table right now. Off the table. Fresno? Um, Fresno, Devin Mathis, I think, is that area. Mathis? Yeah. Riverside? Uh, Riverside. Yeah, Eduardo covers that area. It's a, bit, it's, it's a huge territory, but again, it's got the low population. It's right. It's, 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 he, has a, he has a huge district. This is nice. I mean, to, to, to identify half a dozen potential legislators mm -hmm. to have the message is going to be critical. This what's missing is we don't have a plan to meet to develop the message to make sure that it's okay with everybody. That's the right message, mm -hmm. the right ask, the right ask, the right action. I don't know whether the commission or the caucus or what kind of an instrument we need in order to move the conversation draw people in. So that has to well, be again, worked out. Again, the, the bigger the ask for a uh, commission or a select committee or something like that is also going to get pushed back from folks who are opposed to any single-payer program. So right. that, it, We're that, not going to that ask for single-payer. Right. That's so not even an issue. A real health issue. Yeah. What we're looking for is... The difference between commission and select committee. I've got Do you guys want my information? Or you got it? No. Okay. Commission comes out of the governor's office. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is people get it confused with a agriculture commission and an agriculture commission are actually basically marketing tools. No, so you need mentioned caucuses. Well, yeah, I so ask like you the caucuses and think uh, members of the, the legislature. Let us know. What? Or what is it? Whatever. How so you will caucus, be in the conversation as a power a, stakeholder. A caucus is part of the Democratic Party. And it's not just labor, it's, it's agricultural it's health is not is the caucus. way they're going to get well, in. Because the they're, they're, they've already figured out how to block us on labor. But this agricultural health question is intriguing in its underbelly of the situation where it affects everybody. And it opens up bridges that normally are not there, you know, in the...
class war. It tells you how long it had been since they updated their website. So, um, some but, caucus but this issue is the, one of the, the hearts of the class war. war. It's still the same as 2000. It is the right. so ruling class, class that's going to block us. It's you coming against us. Yeah. 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 So, I got to take off. So I was going to sit there and say, what is it? one of the things is, um, I was going to say is that uh, uh, Frank is also uh, not represented of uh, as many farms as we'd like because, what is it, uh, he's from Yolo County. I mean, Yolo County, he's kind of average for a farmer. They're very progressive farmers over there in, in Yolo County. And so drawing them from them will not always give you the same perspective that you'll get from the rest of the state. But um, Frank's a good starting point, I think, what is it, um, uh, especially. Um, but eventually, you're going to have to draw in some of that. Like you said, he'll talk to about like other organizations. Do you know five or ten farmers of, like him around the state that, are, that uh, come to you from time to time? I know of a couple that I could try to see. Yeah, I think there's outreach for. Great. But, um, 